also got treated in both British House and Spotify streams. All stream handlers assume the musician gets 100% of the royalties. The other day, um, which is how many streams it oh, takes yeah, to yeah, pay yeah. for a thing. <laughs> so if you, if you ever get serious gas and you want to tell yourself not to buy a thing, like you've convinced you've gone on from the forums, it's got yeah. the 3521 chip, not the 3511 chip, so it definitely has a crispier high and meatier lows. And you want to convince yourself not to buy it. Just look at how many streams you need on Spotify to pay for it, and then you, you won't yeah. buy it. It's, yeah, it's, I found a stream calculator, and I was just typing in, like, how s this is just really, this is all messed up. Like, first of all, the streaming thing is messed up, yeah. as we all know. Yes, yeah. Um, and it just justifies not buying something that's that much of a nuance that you wanted. That's really not going to help your career at all. My own studio space in there, like I let like get wildly out of hand, and it was full of stuff I didn't use. And in the end, it becomes like a sort of psychological burden. Yeah, you know absolutely. I mean, like yeah. you, you feel responsible for the stuff, but you so you, but you also feel guilty if you're not using it. So it's beyond distraction. It's not like just having too much so you're distracted. It's like it actually has a sort of a weight on your mind. Yeah, at this absolutely. Time. Like, and also yeah. if you're not ultra rich, where everything is just nothing to you and you can just have it all and never use it, it'll be fine. You see it all as piles of money. Too. Well, that is seeing it as piles of money, but also something that you need to use to create something with. Like that's how I, that's the confusion for me. It's like right now I don't really have a use for that stuff. All these like pedals and all this interesting things like at one point I used it but I also now don't want to use it and part of me is like oh but maybe I'll need to use it or want to use it at some point so I'll keep it but then there's this loyalty like you when you started talking about the loyalty to gear <laughs> oh, yes, I was like, loyalty that's to when gear. I made a sell list for everything mm -hmm. <laughs> that's what I was like I can't this is the dumbest thing because we've basically been counseling each other <laughs> yeah. over voice message for like <laughs> six months about equipment haven't we and that's the yeah, yeah. that's one of the phrases that out of all these hours of chatting kind of sums up one of the toxic relationships you end up with with gear which is gear loyalty yeah, so you, yeah. you're like your <clears throat> Like I was a sort of obsessed with old Casios when I was younger and I collected quite a lot. I still have a few of them uh, since, but something like the CZ 101 that I had, I never used it. It had been sat there for about 11 years yeah. or something. Yeah. I, it was because I got it when it was really cheap and now it's worth more. You think, oh yeah, but it's, you know, it was a cool thing. It took me ages to find one in good condition, but the soft synth is actually better. Mm. <laughs> it's easier to play and easier to program. It sounds the same because it's fully digital and the converters mean nothing and something like that, you know? Mm. And yeah, it's, it just it served no purpose, but I was sort of, like you say, it was, I, was, I, I was loyal to it. Yeah, it's yeah. Just, and it's, ju it's just, as soon as I sold it, I never thought about it again. Yeah. I didn't miss it at all. Yeah. Um, and I have all the eBay photos that I process is just in a folder from when they were processed. So I can go through and look at stuff. And I don't remember I owned it. But it's amazing that that kind of attachment that you develop, isn't it? Where you're sort of, you're convinced that you couldn't possibly let this object, this abstract object yeah. go. And that without it, you'll be a lesser person. But you're often not. You're often actually more creative. But then you? you go back through the folder and think of like, oh, I wonder if it has a good enough now. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> oh, no, someone's as loyal to it. Make some new patches. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely got someone else who yeah. Yeah, won't let it go. <laughs> It's like it's like it's like a sort of global counseling session where, you know, someone will get preoccupied with the idea that um, if they have an original 1073 preamp, all their recordings and music will just be amazing. Yeah, and so exactly. They buy That's it, so and then they realise it does nothing for them yeah. any more than any preamp would do, and they pass it on to the next person who's been fooled by yeah, yeah, the yeah. whole thing. <laughs> it's it's the funny thing that it's easier to buy gear than make music, right? So yeah, it's that whole, and it's it further pushes you away from making music because you're always trying new stuff out and never actually. So that's like, I'm trying to avoid. Because the stuff you had in the States, you, you had a pretty, it's like a multi-generational studio. Isn't yeah, it? it was my dad's studio that was not in use anymore. That was just full of like broken stuff from the 80s. Yeah. That was just like really cool stuff, but a lot of it didn't work. A lot of it did work. Mm -hmm. um, but you'd think, like, if you lived in a studio, like, I moved back during COVID to get the studio up and running, um, you'd think you'd be making music all the time, but it's, like, exactly the opposite of it. Yeah. You're just, like, 
you walk by it and you're like, oh, I don't feel like going in there. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I don't feel like turning everything on. And like, I would have gotten more done if, like, when I moved here, I had an acoustic guitar. Yeah. And I wrote so much more music and I practiced all the time and started a new band. I, did, I don't know. It's just, it's funny how that works. There are some positive sides to this stuff as well. Like, it's not, yeah. it's not just, it's not all negative owning things. It's more like, it's more like if you develop a negative relationship with it, you, you sort of, it becomes like abusive. You're like abused well, by your own gear. But if you, I, yeah. if you develop a positive relationship, then it can be good. Yeah, I think for me, I noticed a trend is, and this was definitely during COVID, is like before that, everything was being used to make music with. Yeah. And then I had found certain things that I like really connected with musically, certain devices, and was writing patches or just like, creating like actually have a sound personally with it mm. and like the old lexicon thing we talk about is one thing that i really like and i can use it because i can carry it with which me one, on the gig models are they? the lxp5 and the one the reverb but the five is cooler because you can program so much more into it mm -hmm. and then i got to the point where like i would see things that would come out and i was like oh that would be cool I'd, and I'd, I'd buy it and then realizing there's a huge learning curve for it, mm. which I'm into. Like I read manuals. I've I read manuals for gear I don't have yet, <laughs> which is weird, but I enjoy That's it. Good. Um, I've never done that. Don't be obsessed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, like that whole thing, and then realizing like I'm just I'm not using this for music. I'm actually just like it's sitting there. And it, I'm not really inside of it. Like a piece of gear becoming part of your instrument is always what I'm after. Mm -hmm. Like that's what I think about with like the Line 6 DL4. Like I got that at a time when I was like discovering how to use pedals and things. And I, I immediately just like found so much personal sound within how I interacted with that thing. And it's hard to not use it now because of that because it's part of the instrument. But like mm. when you keep getting into this buying gear thing, mm. you're not like connecting with something. And then the music suffers, I think, you know, so that's, yeah. I think that's the big thing I realize. That's a cool, that's a, one of the core points, isn't it? The FOMO thing, because like, especially in guitar land, almost everything that's new is marketed with FOMO, isn't it? So you, Absolutely, you, you limit yeah. the run as much as possible. You make sure that you, you do pre-orders, limited run, all yeah. this sort of thing, and it creates a big buzz on forums mm -hmm. and on and YouTubers, of course, going yeah, yeah. <laughs> next to it. You sell it all out. And then it's, it's kind of like, if you get into that FOMO thing, you can convince yourself that you need anything. And it's usually a very good demo. You watch that one demo. It's not something you'd ever do musically, but it sounds great when yeah. they do it. Yeah, yeah. It's not just the thing sits in front of you. You can do that thing they did once, and you go, that was fun. Yeah. And then you're lost, you know, if you've bought it based on a sort yeah. of... And so there's so many... Uh, mainly it seems to be pedals. No, I don't think it's quite, as, it's quite the same as synths because they're always really versatile by their nature, but there's plenty of pedals now that literally do one sound very yeah, well. Yeah, it's yeah. designed for what we like to call Instagrambient, maybe, yeah, isn't yeah, it? Like you, you, you yeah. do ambient stuff by you, you get a 900 pound plug-in in a box. <laughs> and, then you, and then you put a tape recorder next to it. You film it from above, with, make sure there's a, a tape running around a cactus. Yeah. And then, but you never make any songs. So you, yeah, you're talking about sort of performing and the symbiosis between a player and equipment. Like that's what actually makes the music. Uh, yeah. You said something earlier before we were filming, which is great, which is a pedal doesn't make music. And that's true. Yeah. Uh, aside from if you're self-oscillating and that's your yeah, entire right. set is self-oscillation, <laughs> I guess. But in general, that, that remains a fact. And there is sort of... Um, a, there's a real difference between how how it feels to make music with something, especially in front of people, mm. and how it feels to sort of um, have that symbiotic relationship of musician and kit, and how it feels to sit at home obsessively AB, yeah. ABing things, or sit at home sort of obsessing over the minutiae of patches. Like, it's a very different thing. And you, you were saying something quite interesting recently about gigs because you'd mm -hmm. you'd, you were trying to get another piece of gear to sound like another. Tell, tell that, yeah, story. yeah. it's quite interesting. Well, with, there's one like inherent problem with the DL4. I think 
It's the version that I have. It's the very early one. The script logo, DL4. <laughs> um, ultra and rare. A, Look, yeah, the ultra rare. Pounds. Yeah, the original, 1999, I think. Um, that I got for fifteen dollars at a record expo, in in Danbury, Connecticut. <laughs> Someone was selling the Line Six pedals along with all their records for fifteen dollars. <laughs> so you got the records and the pedals. Uh, no, I just got the okay. pedal. He had, he had the modulation one and the delay one, and I was like, oh, I'll just get the delay. It's fifteen dollars, and I should like I didn't yes. think I should have bought both and sold the other one. Oh, we all have like, those stories, yeah. So. Yeah. Next if you're time. out there. Next yeah. time, buy everything. Yeah, Always buy, buy everything. everything. Yeah, you there you go. See. Gas. Gas. Just in case. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so there's like a little bit of a volume drop, which you really you can kind of feel when you play, which for what I'm playing, that makes a difference. I really I notice. But only when you're in a room by yourself mm -hmm. because you can obsess over those minor details. And then... I was just watching back gig footage and I noticed the point at which I kicked in that pedal mm. and I know there would have been that little bit of difference yes, that I would have obsessed about when I was practicing and nothing changed. There was no difference noticed. Yes. And that's always the case yeah, with really. these things in live situations. Because the other it's, one you had was the, because you were talking about the Lexicon LXP 5, which, you know, it's really cool, does loads of stuff, but it's a lower quality build than the, the main one from the time, yeah, the XP15. Yeah. So they, yeah. they designed it, even though it, it came with like a two double half rack rack yeah, adapter yeah. and all that shit. Which I have, um, I guess. Of course, do you guess. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it was designed to be, they, they used to make half rack stuff a semi pro, so it almost mm, always right, had. Right. Minus minus 10B signal and all that sort of thing. Like it was it was it was unprofessional line level a lot of the time. Mm. Um, it was poorer quality build. So as a result, they're known for being quite temperamental, aren't they? And so you wanted to take something else live was the idea. And I remember you said something about trying to remake those patches. Yeah, and the realization oh yeah, that, yeah. So I, I was trying to. Yeah. So that was one thing I noticed is like remaking the patches of that and. Because I, because it's fragile, I don't want to take it out all the time. I've burned mm. through three already. Because I, I love the thing, so I'm stockpiling them. Gas. Gas. Um, <laughs> and yeah, there was a funny moment when I was in rehearsal, and I had all the 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 pedals that I used to remake the sound that I was using for this one thing, and I can tell the difference slightly um, of the sounds, and. It, the pedals were plugged into the lexicon and then into the amp and the lexicon was bypassed mm. and then the other guitarist I was playing with said oh man that lexicon sounds amazing and I was just like fuck it doesn't matter none of it matters <laughs> <laughs> none of it matters man so this, this, it this doesn't the matter the H9 that you are recreating the H9 it I recreate in. yeah and, and the pitch shifter just isn't as like nice as yeah, yeah. it's just not it's got that sort of sharper, tinkly, sort of more obvious sample. Yeah, kind of and, and also like you can't filter it. Right? There's something about the LXP5 when you play chords that aren't just like power chords mm -hmm. or, or simple chords. When you play more like depth, it doesn't glitch like the H9 glitches, and you get notes that aren't part of the aren't part of the chord. Now you see, well, and I can't play anything but power chords, <laughs> so that's going to be fine for me. <laughs> well, it's just it's just annoying when I'm playing it, and it's like ah, oh, it, there's. There's a music okay. This is where there's it. a musical glitch to the LXP5 yeah. where I find the H9 isn't as musical. There you go. Go for, well, so what is that musical glitch? I don't know. It just sounds nice. It's like Fair you enough. know people obsess about the the original whammy pedal. That there's that part in that um, mm. that Radiohead tune. There there's like this one quintessential like. Whammy, glitchy sound. I can't think of what My it's called. My iron lung has that at the start. Of the day. That's that's one I of can't. the pitch. That's yeah, the yeah. Kind of, uh, that that was one. If yeah. you look through the forums over the years, as we probably both have done, never. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's now, like yeah. the obsessive thing, and it's really funny because it gets to the point where <clears> the forums <throat> um, affect the actual pedal. Industry, yeah, yeah, of course it is. Where yeah, now, yeah. if you look at the new whammies, they have the classic switch, mm -hmm. which is 
the glitch from the original Even pedal. Even Autotune did that with the plugin. They put really? watching classic into the algorithms. I can't remember in what manner because I haven't used it in years, but it was either in one of the programs there was a classic mode or there was a separate plugin called classic. Yeah. But yeah, they, they again, like people wanted the original share yeah. believe yeah, yeah. glitch. So that, that's so common in music, isn't it? I, mean, I noticed with the DL4 you mentioned as well, like the new version, they actually, you can just have all the original algorithms in it. I know, and switch I know. It to the notes, so you can have your nice shiny hi-fi 2020s algorithms or you can have all the original ones. But, but they got they got rid of a few, of a few like Musical glitches, musical that, glitches that existed yeah. in it. Yeah, yeah. there's one of those with something to do with the, like when you turn a setting, when you've got yeah. a setting in a certain way, it goes mad, doesn't it? Is yeah, the there's uh, there's something cool. <clears throat> I can I have a recording. Maybe we could stick it. Yeah, on. we can stick that in as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah the glitch, because, the glitch that's gone from the new version. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I don't know, that's just super obsessive kind of mm. stuff. I mean, a friend of mine came by with the new one and it sounds incredible. Yeah. And he's doing extremely musical things with yes, it too. Yeah. The key is to finding your stuff that you make music with, as opposed to continually buying and trying things out and kind of taking the bait of, of what's coming out. Um, well, maybe to finish that yeah. thought in a different way that um, r rather the key is... Um, you know, to find the stuff you make with it rather than letting the stuff define you in a yeah, way. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Because otherwise, because yeah. there's, um, I've found in my endless gear buyings and sellings over the years that the things that you do use a lot, um, there's two keys to it. One is you have to set everything up so that you can use it whenever you think uh, of it. Yeah, of course. Because yeah. if, if, you, if you do have something unplugged and in a corner, it stays in that corner for five years yeah. and you sell it. Like you yeah, have yeah. to have it plugged in and available because there's yeah. nothing more depressing when you go, oh shit, I really want to do something, yeah. than having to go and wire things for 15 minutes. Oh man, yes. Um, and the other one is it has to be things that in and of themselves sort of inspire you to want to fool around with them. And I, I, I used to be, I started off obviously software only like everybody did. I amassed hardware stuff. Now I have two setups and they're completely opposite. And one is iPad, which I bought as an auto cue for filming and stuff. And so I thought, well, since I have to have an iPad for filming, I might as well try it for music. Mm. Very lightweight. It only, all I have is a launch pad and a, the Headrush MX-5 for plugging guitar in. So even the guitar is like a separate discrete thing and it gets tracked in and you can't fiddle with it anymore because you commit it to you know, mm. a launch pad for playing with because I'm not very good at keys. You know, let's you do scale modes and chord modes. We can program chords and play stuff more easily. And then an, an iPad and an interface. I have, there is actually a Korg X5D there, X5DR there, but really that's for no reason than fun. I, I could take that out and do just as much stuff. And that's very inspirational because you just go click, 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 turn it on and you can just go. Yeah. And that's using logic on the iPad, which is surprisingly good. Mm. Um, and then the other setup is in the studio where it's, there's an entire rack of analog compressors a MIDI router that routes out to like 10 different synths, there's MIDI guitars, there's amps, there's all sorts of stuff. But recently I found that I did actually, I have actually made more stuff on the home setup yeah. than, I, than I do in there. And in order to bridge that gap I got that MIDI router because I realised the problem is every time I'm trying to use the hardware stuff, it's, it's not available. So I'm, I'm ready to play something, ready to make an idea and I have to dick around with cables for selling. You just and don't. And it's gone, yeah. It's gone, yeah. So, <laughs> so I bought that. It's expensive, like four, 400 and something quid. But it all, it's basically a MIDI interface for life. You'll never yeah, need another because yeah, yeah. it just does all USB and MIDI to yeah. anything. And Until they change USB. Yes, yeah. With the, I'll be holding out with the last USB <laughs> interface. They'll be coming in with the SWAT team to take it and recycle it um, for carbon credits while yeah. I'm holding <laughs> onto it for dear life. <laughs> then they'll render me down and yeah. feed me to people. <laughs> Silent green is yeah, people, <laughs> but yeah, it's um, so it's an expensive investment. But suddenly, your masses of hardware becomes creative again yeah, if yeah. it's plugged in, and if you can actually use it. That's the thing, yeah, because making yourself a musician and not an engineer mm. plus musician, because then it becomes like you're doing both job, both jobs, at fifty percent. Mm. That's I don't think you can. I just don't think it's possible to do both at a hundred percent. Um, because if you're thinking about like all that technical stuff while you're trying to create something musical, it's just it just takes you out of it. I mean, I'm sure that there mm. are a lot. I mean, there's loads of people that are good at it. Mm -hmm. I'm just not good. At that. I should say that's my own take on it because yeah, yeah. 
there are so many people that are good at that and, and like make a career out of doing that. But um, I don't know, just from working in the studio that I had trying to play and the more taxing the music got, um, the more impossible it is to engineer, yeah. I think. I think um, it, it also depends on the sort of process you're trying to do. I know what you mean, because I used to always mix things as I went, but it's an it's a absolute curse and I'd encourage people not to do it because you inevitably get dragged down. To, mixing is an obsessive thing. Mm. Like it's an obsessive minutia based thing, really, balancing and cutting frequencies and getting stuff moving. And it's, it should be after composition, yeah. it really should. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's so easy when you've grown up in computer land like I did, um, just purely on you know, sequencing on uh, Fruity Loops, as it was called then, mm. uh, FL Studio, and before that on a PlayStation on Music 2000 yeah. was how I very yes. first started out. There's nothing else but, but sequencing. Yeah. And the PlayStation was more creative at first because yeah. you can't mix in it. Yeah, so you can't right. dick yeah. around constantly, whereas as soon as you get to Fruity yeah. Loops, you, oh, you've got a mixer. But if you don't have an engineer to help you, I think you're right. You shouldn't really be engineering. And, and part of what I'm saying there is do the engineering beforehand. All of it. Yeah. So my all my yeah, patch bays yeah, exactly. yeah. are full normal. Right. So if I go if I just go out one and two, in one and two, that's one of the compressors. Mm. And I put the drums into that and it's like cool, if that gives it a vibe while I'm writing something, mm -hmm. I just have to wire it in, do the knobs and I'm done. You yeah. don't have to fool around. So yeah. you if you if you can't afford an, an a separate engineer, which most of yeah. us can't, yeah. let the you of the past be your engineer, like set it up. Yeah. So it all just works. Yeah, exactly. That's the key. Yeah, it's easy as the person making it nowadays, especially because so much is available to us, um, especially on the computer, mm. like that we can obsess and try to make it sound perfect. Whereas, like, I don't know, there's so many. I think of Ken when I think of like recordings that are so inspirational and sound amazing, mm. and they were just like two mics in a room yeah. catching a, a rehearsal or, or just them playing and. And they're, tra I don't know, they're super um, inspirational, uh, what's the word, influential tracks that yeah. now exist. It's the production reflecting the emotion of the piece, and that's often lost mm. when you obsess too much about engineering. Yeah. The whole of it, all of this kit and all of this technique is only there to back up the emotional force of a person connecting with another person. It's mm -hmm. not supposed to be the purpose. It's yeah, supposed right, to be right. all the technology that, that helps you get that message across. Yeah. And yeah, if you spend enough time on forums and FOMO and YouTube as well, you, yeah, um, look out. you end up obsessing about the wrong thing. Yeah. And what inspires you to do music in the first place is always a musician connecting with you, not uh, <laughs> what chip it's got. Yeah, well, or, that's the thing. I was just thinking what components like, in there. How, how often do people uh, type in to when well, they want to find a song or something like music mastered through a fair yeah. a real you know what I mean like yeah. no one no, no one can hear it I mean this is my playlist of stuff mastered yeah, through a yeah, real yeah exactly fair yeah yeah it's like yeah I'm playing you can this hear the crispy yeah, eyes it's so it's just <laughs> when you think about it from that aspect of it it's so dumb. There is something, yeah, surreal about that. And you see, it's like the fucking cabin fever that you get from the internet that, yeah. that takes you, everything it takes you away oh, from man. music. Yeah. It takes, yeah. Stay away from the internet. So there's two, there's two kind of different ways to look at um, music as well, isn't there? Because th not everyone who buys all this stuff even wants to be a professional performing musician. Like some people do, literally. Mm. They just, like the old jokes of the blues dentist yeah. and so on, they, they just buy the stuff to sit in a room and play it to themselves. Yeah. And sometimes it becomes an obsessive rabbit hole of catching a tone, but it's for yeah. no other reason than just to do it for themselves. So there is, there is a, it's sort of a confusing thing to talk about in broad terms, because there are a lot of people out there who push, who fund that, fund that industry to a huge yeah. degree, oh, yeah. but don't actually want to play any music. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very strange yeah. one. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's a lot of people after playing like classic rock and yeah, that kind yeah. of stuff that want to the exact fuzz pedal with the same transistor mm. that Jimi Hendrix had on this one recording yeah. because someone said it had that on a forum in like 1998 yeah. or something. <laughs> you know, there's all this like myth stuff going around. And it's cool actually, um, JHS, that guy's actually been like demystifying a lot yeah, of this yeah, stupid that, forum yeah. stuff, yeah. which I really appreciate because um, it's just ridiculous. But I'm glad I sold my rat before that video came out because I did get a lot of money for it for no yes, reason. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, well, I, I did the opposite. I, I left it too long to sell my DM2. I bought a Boss oh, DM2 yeah, right, for 25 yeah. quid. But it didn't have the good chip. Yeah, actually, yeah. it was a weird one. It was like a, it was a black label first edition with the later chip. So obviously, big it's font. cursed. It was the big font. Though. Yeah, so yeah. it's not, it just doesn't. Didn't doesn't, sound it good. It just sounds awful. So, but we, yeah. so we actually tested this. We put the, D, the DM2 and the DM3 side by side and some other stuff. You had an H9 and a Lexicon yeah. and all sorts of stuff. They all sounded the same. Basically yeah. all sounded the same, didn't they? So the DM2 and the DM3, if you, we were like leaning in when it was tails and then turning it up really loud and you could hear that the three had more clock noise, which I actually preferred. Yeah. And so and that was it. That was absolutely it. Other than that, if you weren't listening, you could like switch back and forth. And once you it's lost how many times you've done it, you just couldn't tell the difference. I mean, there's, there's, but still, you will still, I can't remember the ship numbers. I don't really want to. But still, there's, there's people who, who will, who were messaging me when I sold the DMT saying, mm. has it got the chip? Has oh, it got really? That they chip? were asking you. Oh, that's chip. interesting. I, I didn't say, know. That. No, no, it doesn't have that chip. It has the later chip. You should have drew fine. zero on it. Yeah, exactly. Just, you can scrub yeah. it out or something like scratch it off. That's a funny one. But yeah, so it's, yeah. it's, it's so, so people often get, really dragged down into this minutia of thing. And I, I think that is, to try and be fair if I can, it's, it's sort of, it is basically a separate hobby. It's a completely yeah, it's separate hobbyist. thing. It's, it's, it's actually hobby. not. Yeah, that's true. Like the, the reason it's not about making music at that point is making music isn't the hobby. It, there's a whole chunk to whom is sold stuff to fool around with on, online. It's, yeah. it's, it's very odd. Yeah, and it's like thinking about something that can take you further away from making music is is the constant a being of these things. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I used to work at Analog Man. Mm. I could had access to these pedals and mm. could try things out and all that. But the amount of time I spent a being like overdrive pedals in that period, I wish I could have that time yeah. back because it's just so dumb. And and I just think that's uh, nothing is less musical than that less productive that's just you'll get nowhere really it's almost like it's the sort of stage that everyone goes through and if you can just not you'll yeah. have so much more time on yeah. your hands to do stuff that's useful you know because yeah. everyone's been through it. i went through that ab overdriving sp stage um with like fuzzes and overdrives and all sorts of things and it just it, it really it really doesn't matter and then, like it's, yeah, it's, yeah. It, and, and also it's very you you will have a lot to say about this as well which is it's very very different the kind of tone you need playing full pelt with the band so what yeah, you need in your room absolutely well that's a big one and then also the only time you notice a being is when you're a being yes <laughs> so yeah, like yeah, there's yeah. a great video of wayne krantz doing a rig rundown mm. and he's talking about like having used this one wah pedal for ages, like the period of his music that's like got him most well known. He was using this crybaby, and then he was using some other wah at the time. And he was talking about how there's less tone suck on the new wah. Yeah. But the old wah, he's like, the only reason I know there's tone suck is because I AB'd them. Yes. If you don't AB them, you don't know there's that tone suck. That just is the tone. That's yeah, the sound. Yeah. And, and I think about that. There's just so many recordings that, like, maybe there's tone suck. Who knows, <laughs> yeah. man? Like, well, I don't can know. Can you imagine sitting so, listening? Oh, I can hear the tone suck yeah, there. Yeah. Hendrix <laughs> should have used a different pedal. That's yeah, not what people do. It's crazy, do. No it's crazy man. It's just so... That yeah. thing, that, that, there's a good point in that you don't know that there's tone suck because it's just the music, um, is uh, the, you're always going to make what you want to hear, right? So if one thing is more trebly than the other, it doesn't matter. Yeah. If it's, this is more trebly in the same knob position because the knob position is fucking irrelevant. Yeah, yeah, Because you're going to yeah. dial it to sound exactly. like what you want it to sound yeah, like. Yeah, exactly. So if if one you of them use is, your ears, that's the thing. Precisely. So you're, you're, you know. you're always going to... Which is why one of the big jokes come from listen with your eyes. Yeah, <laughs> listen with your eyes. I've got to yeah. listen with my eyes, there's, guys. I just remind, reminded myself, there's another clip of uh, a great one of Nels Klein at a rig rundown. And he's got this massive pedal board and he just is making insane sounds. Yeah. Amazing guitarist and, and sonic like explorer, amazing guitarist. Um, and the guy asked him, he's like, with all these pedals, are you worried about uh, signal degradation? 
And Nels Klein just goes, degradation is my sound. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. You know, it's a it's, t-shirt worthy yeah, one, Yeah, exactly. De- yeah. One of the things you can use buying and selling for and make it a positive is sort of long-term words. <laughs> Long, long-term auditioning. Lo- a lot of stuff doesn't really lose a lot of value. So if you, if you music gear, if you buy it secondhand, often by the time you finish rolling around with it, it's either the same price it's gone up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So you can, have, you can have a pool of money, say, oh, I've got a thousand pounds to spend on stuff, you can buy a thousand pounds of stuff and sell it. You know, those free eBay selling things come around every so often. You can mm-hmm. sell things and not pay a lot of fees or pay no fees and then buy a different thing. So you can sort of have a pool of money that just stays in stuff um, and not really lose cash. Um, and I think um, that can be a positive. Where it becomes a negative is where it becomes like the, the classic Euro rack thing where people, they go, oh, I'm just going to, I have a couple of friends. I was going to name them and I think it's a bit mean, so I won't. There's a couple of people I know who've, who've done this, at least four, I think who've got, you know, one little Eurorack thing and bought a module and go, that's where I'm stopping. And then they're 20 grand in or so like yeah, ridiculous oh, amounts of money, like walls of things that they just don't need and they don't make any music with it and it takes you a day to make a snare drum that sounds yeah, yeah. shit compared to a 909. <laughs> and it's all that sort of thing. So it, there is a balance to be found. But you can, you can sort of, you can find your sound by having a pool of money that you put into stuff and just flip it until you find something you really, that inspires you. Like we said in the beginning, like I moved here, I didn't have that much. I left tons of stuff home, um, and I kind of escaped all this gear. And I found this new creativity, just having a guitar and nothing else. And I learned so much from that period mm-hmm. about relationship to like having stuff and feeling loyal to gear and like just letting it kind of take you over and not create with it. And also noticed as a musician, like the periods where I'm playing live less is when I kind of get more obsessed with mm. nuance of gear. Yeah, And that's something to keep an eye out for, I think. Yeah, because your album that you've recently made was, I remember seeing you writing bits of that. And at the time you were writing that, uh, or seeing you around the time you're writing, mm-hmm. and you were mostly on acoustic guitar with sheet music around. Yeah, and yeah. It's like that, especially like the music you do is quite it's quite sort of virtuosic in a way compared to the sort of stuff I've done in the past, like punk rock and dance music. Like mm-hmm. yours involves real musicianship. You have to really be able to play to play that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's really important that you connect yeah. with that. You know, yeah, like it's, yeah. it, you can see how in that kind of genre it's a massive distraction to be have gear taking over because it's yeah. really supposed to be about the interaction between the player's hands and the instrument, yeah. isn't it? And yeah, expressing absolutely. that music. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are certain tools like th- th- these things if they're serving the music, and you're writing, including certain things in the music. It's like taking the music into a new direction. That's great. But a being doesn't do that. Mm. Having the perfect overdrive in your bedroom doesn't get you anywhere. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's true. I mean, it's like um, effects and gear should be the icing on the cake. You, you don't want to just sit there and eat a block of icing. Yeah, that's yeah, not, that's yeah. not really <laughs> pleasurable that's, for that's anybody. That's true. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like one of the things is it's a little treat that tops off the chore of eating the sponge, yeah. <laughs> and the other one is you just get diabetes and have a go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Happy yeah. gassing. Happy gassing. 